Zoom in, Zim. As we do on Zoom in, I like to just dive into discussion. The purpose of this Fabulous. program is to talk through issues that are relevant to the Zimbabwean community, both at home and abroad. And of course, with COVID-19 being so topical, a lot of people want to understand the initiatives that are taking place. You've got multiple parties, multiple people working on a whole host of initiatives. And this platform is trying to pull it all in together and make sure that we're all on the same page. To start, Karen, could you tell us about yourself? We know that you're a businesswoman. We know that you've been involved in a range of initiatives, but I'd love to understand a little bit more about your background and what you represent. Okay. So one of the many questions that I get asked is how do I balance work, family, <laughs> and business and everything else that I do? So first and foremost, I'm a mother of three, um, but I also have lots of other children who may not have come from my womb. Right. And I'm a wife, um, but I have been in the beauty and fashion industry for um, about 30 years. I'm going to be 50 this year. I, I'm proud to no say way. I will be 50. <laughs> <laughs> so definitely, I think I'm known most in the beauty and fashion industry. Yeah. Um, I've been yeah. in it for a long time. Sure. Really great to hear that off you. Most people who are on this particular COVID-19 page are curious to know what Zimbabweans are doing for Zimbabweans as it relates to COVID-19. So could you tell me a little bit about any contribution that you've made? When you heard that COVID is a pandemic, what was your response? Well, to be honest, initially January, when we first heard about it, we were pretty much relaxed and we thought, you know, it's a cold and it's going to affect old people and it's not going to affect babies, etc. February came and still a little bit more relaxed and, you know, everybody was kind of saying oh shame you know it's it's sad what's going on but we're fine and then um a young man who i considered one of my sons as well he he'd gone to new york and he came back and he was tested positive and uh, he didn't survive and with his death came a huge wake-up call for everybody because he really was you know at the forefront of so many initiatives he was a leader in his age group he really was a, a mentor even for a lot of people and he was a role model for a lot of young people as well so with the death of Zororo it woke up everybody in fact it's almost like he was the martyr of COVID for Zimbabwe. So it's been widely publicized um, how the medical facilities in Zimbabwe were ill-prepared for Zorora's treatment. Yes. And of course, we are all grief-stricken. I didn't know him personally, but any sort of loss of life that could have been prevented is obviously very upsetting for us all. What was your reaction to the state of our hospitals? Well, it was clear that they were ill-equipped, that they really also, I think, got a shock at um, the severity of it and uh, they were not prepared. And with that in mind, using my network, um, I galvanized as many people as I could from, you know, a cross-section, very broad private sector, doctors, clinicians, IT people, uh, financial gurus, pharmaceutical people. And we got together and brainstormed and that's how we came up with a trust called the Solidarity Trust mm -hmm. uh, Zimbabwe mm -hmm. initiative. And our main purpose at that time was to see how we could lobby the nuns of St. Anne's to reopen the hospital and use it as a COVID center. Um, as you know, St. Anne's has been closed for about seven years. So it was a concerted effort. We were very blessed that there were a couple of people within our group who knew the sisters and uh, so began the negotiation and it's now going to be ready to be opened to the public, you know, I mean, to everybody. And it will offer 100 beds as well as um, an ICU and an HDU. With that process going on, we then, within the group, we realized that the network was so fantastic and everybody was coming together in the most magnificent way. It's just been so, so, so humbling to see how Zimbabwean people, once they get together and they have a common purpose, it's fantastic. So with that happening, we then um, decided that in order to get it up and running, St. Anne's was going to require quite a bit of funding. We realized that we cannot do it alone. We need to partner with government. And uh, with that in mind, we then got an MOU signed with the Ministry of Health. In doing that, it has
has opened up the possibility for us to also, as the trustees, take on about another five hospitals Very good. around the country so that it's not just Harare. So we've got Bulawayo, as well as Yushavani, as well as Victoria Falls, Gweru, Mutare Infectious Disease Hospital. And there are other groups who've also come on board and they've taken on some other hospitals as well. Right. So it's been quite a journey. And we have, you know, within the group, a lady called Ethel Kuhuya, who is a, a data analyst and guru, and she created a platform for us to be able to hook on to the 2019 call center number, a hotline number. And it's the national hotline number that will be live. We'll be able to do triage. So if somebody calls the free hotline number, they can have speak to a nurse. If they've got symptoms that have been escalated, they can then go on to a doctor. Right. From the doctor, if they need an ambulance or they need testing, they can go to them. That in itself will be amazing in order to get them to stay at home and not just rush to go to a center and possibly cross-contaminate or infect other people. So the hotline is going to be critical to making sure that we prevent the spread. Yeah. So we've got a number of initiatives as SOTZIM, that's short for Solidarity Trust Zimbabwe, we are addressing for COVID. And that's a really important point that you raise around, you know, people not leaving home unnecessarily. And of course, for, for most people at the point that you think that you might have an illness as severe as COVID-19, your instinct is to want to go and have that checked out by a doctor. But then we as well live in quite communal societies. So that risk of cross-contamination is real both at home and in a hospital. What are your thoughts around how our culture is set up to kind of drive some of these global initiatives we're seeing, such as isolation? It's a huge challenge. I always say to people that in some of the European you know, countries where they're not as touchy-feely and huggy and kissy, <laughs> exactly. or they don't have oh, really. and sekuru yeah, right. <laughs> and, and muzukuru and you know, everybody living in the same house, mm. it's not surprising mm. that some of those countries have lower uh, mortalities and lower you know, numbers. So in Zimbabwe, it is very difficult. And I think, thankfully, a lot of um, the population is kum. Mm -hmm. And Kumusha, mm -hmm. you know, they will struggle more with the economic hardships, oh. more than COVID, for example. Mm -hmm. However, in the cities, they have tried to make sure they practice the hand washing and they practice, mm -hmm. you know, trying, they're all trying to wear masks now and make them at home oh. and try and pass the word on and educate each other. And the awareness needs to definitely be greater. So it's a challenge because, like I said, we live in communities where you can have, you know, a lot of people in one place, in Correct. one home, actually. Indeed. It's one thing to be in a house in Glen Lawn, just at Titi Mandara, where, you know, you don't have neighbors to worry about. But it's another thing where your bread and butter is based on daily trade. I've got to go to Musika. I've got to sell something in order to feed my family tonight. Whilst I appreciate that the trust cannot be all things to all people, what sort of thoughts or considerations, if any, have you made around funding and supporting families that are in absolute distress and who are left with the choice, would I rather die from hunger or from COVID? So we do have a task force within the SOTSIM initiative, and that's the food drive. So apart from the frontline health workers, who we've had lots of donations and sponsorships from several companies who have come forward and said they're going to provide food. We've also said, look, we've got to try to um, galvanize as much support for the vulnerable. For example, people who live in with disabilities, the old age homes, the orphanages. So we've thought about it and said, if we were able to get food baskets, for example, and those could be distributed through the churches throughout the country so that they have like a food pantry and people could then go to their church, register so that they're not doubling up or taking it to go and sell, for example, and come and get a food pack. There's a lot going on, not just within Satsim, but within lots of different groups in the country like CZI and Business Fighting COVID. There's loads of initiatives and people are trying, but it's tough. I mean, the latest statistic is that 8 million Zimbabweans will not have food. And that's really scary. It's very encouraging to 
learn of all these initiatives that are taking place and to really see Zimbabweans both on the ground and in the diaspora really coming together in a bid to make a difference back home. You know, there's been endless call to actions. If everybody was to contribute a dollar, what a difference that would make. Next week, we're, we're hoping to start our the Satsim um, funding campaign yes. and we're going to put it out to all the diaspora as well as just lo- lots of people who live so, on so many continents. There's Zimbabweans everywhere and they are already reaching out and saying, what can I do? Even with the, with the hotline, we've had nurses and doctors who are in the UK and in America saying, well, if you're going to operate 24 hours, I'm awake, I'm at home, I can handle some of the calls. It's been absolutely absolutely incredible. So should I be a doctor in Milwaukee and I want to get involved, how do I reach out to you and how would I be able to sign up? So you would go to www.sotzim.org. As a businesswoman, I think one of our worst nightmares is not being able to operate businesses. And, mm. <laughs> and the dreaded contingency planning, continuity planning is one thing that we don't typically think about normally because we don't think that any big disaster is going to strike. For your fellow entrepreneurs out there, what advice would you give them on balancing the need to continue operating a business within the confines of lockdown, shutdown, um, etc.? and protecting your workforce? Well, initially for us, it was, you know, the most important thing was to protect and to make sure that the workforce is supported so that by the time this is over, we still have them and we haven't lost them. (laughs) So that was really important um, as a business for us to do. Once they've been at home, it's to then continue to motivate them, to be able to counsel them, to bring them together, to share notes, to, I mean, I I challenge some of our, our therapist to say every day show us an exercise that you're doing at home for example or do something you know that's going to be add to to society and then with my marketing team what we've done is said look we've got to remain relevant people are on their phones you know gadgets all day since they're at home so let's make sure that the brand is still uh, recognized it's still um, visible by the time we reopen which I hope is going to be soon we will not have lost too much mm-hmm. and we can really mm-hmm. just smoothly transition back into full blown business again so i think that it's important for people to to not sit back and just give up and say well you know this is it we've got to remain relevant got to be active have brand you know brand strategies and marketing strategies in order to be ready once this is over and of course we're now depending heavily on technology to push these messages and the brand awareness out have you had to rethink your marketing strategy or have you just continued on the same continuum you were on before? Oh, no, we've definitely had to think about, about it. It's been a lot more information and to show that we care. We care about our clients. We care about their well-being as well. So it's not just about come and have a treatment or <laughs> it's about, you know what, this is a remedy that you could use or we've really used this time to reestablish our core values in terms of who we we are and what we do and and remind people about our brand that's what i mean i've done and i think i've seen a lot of that happening with other organizations who are, are doing the same thing i mean there's i think zoom must be overloaded with different <laughs> board meetings and strategy sessions that are going on the other thing that we did was with organics i didn't mention that i'm also a foodie um i absolutely have a passion for 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 food and for cooking i don't like to eat it as much as i like to create we have organics and and so initially, we'd started just doing takeaway. Um, but now, since we've got the lockdown, it's an essential service because people still need to eat. So we're doing delivery. And um, and that's that's working quite well. And of course, we're making sure that the whoever's doing the delivery is safe and is got their mask and is, you know, got the hand sanitizers and there's no um, contact. If COVID-19 has brought anything, it is a real reinvention, if you like, of how businesses operate. I can recount a story of being in Zimbabwe, wanting to go out for a meal at 9.30 on a Monday night and not being able to find anything other than Nando's. No disrespect to that, of course, but it would be nice to have a bit of an option. So here's hoping that the home delivery and all these initiatives do carry on post-COVID-19. Absolutely. It's very important. For those 
I assume that every businesswoman, every businessman is a mentor and has taken the younger generations, you know, along with them on the road to all things entrepreneurial. What is it you're telling your mentees at the moment about either rethinking their businesses, starting businesses, or just remaining focused on ideas that they might have had before this crisis hit? Uh, when I am mentoring, I always say, look for opportunity within the challenges that come up in whatever is happening in the marketplace. So with COVID, um, there's definitely opportunity and that is within things like manufacturing. Um, just in the last two weeks, almost all the clothing manufacturers are now importing as much fabric as they can or using what they've got in stores and making PPE. And the quality of it so far has been fantastic mm-hmm. and they'll be able to export it. It's almost like a new industry has been created which can resuscitate some of our manufacturing. So I think that's an opportunity that a lot of young people can look into. They could come together and as a consortium, you know, one one could do masks and one could do aprons and one could do the booties or whatever that might be within the PPE uh, menu. And then the other opportunity is definitely pharmaceutical. We've got with the hydrochloroquine and Zithromax and all of that. So uh, medicines that could be made in Zimbabwe, it would be fantastic to collaborate with some of the multinationals. And resuscitate our pharmaceutical instead of just importing all the medicines let's try to have as much as we can made locally Mm -hmm. so that we don't ever have to struggle the next time there's a there's a need for medicines or equipment i think that um, there's opportunities in, in a lot of arenas and it's really just to not panic to sit down and say where am i the authority what point of difference do i have that can contribute to making a difference within the business environment. And what a lot of people might want to understand is what the ease ease of doing business is. So yes, I've got this great idea. Yes, I've got the knowledge, but how do I go about getting licensing or, you know, being authorized to actually start this manufacturing business? And I suppose part of the intel that you might be able to share, should you be aware, is how simple or not it might be. Doing business anywhere in the world is not easy. People think that it's easy, but it's not easy. It doesn't matter where you are. There's always a process and you've got to be patient and you have to be deliberate and you have to be very disciplined and methodical and strategic at the same time. What I think is most important is coming together where people have ideas, but most often they work you know, in little silos. That is a huge issue in Zimbabwe. And you'll find that one person will start something and within a week, somebody's copied them. <laughs> Instead of you know having capacity and bringing people together, and it's, it is about capacity and to bring all those ideas together and capitalize on that and come together, collaborate. And then once you've done that and people see that you're serious and you're not just thinking small, they've got to think big, really big. And, you know, and then take your ideas to some of the corporates that are out there who are constantly looking for talent. I mean, we've got the most amazing, I mean, our human capital in Zimbabwe is amazing. And you've seen that from just around the world, people who've left, yeah. but even the people who are yeah. sitting here, talented, really well educated, the opportunity, for example, just with call centers, mm-hmm. we could offer mm-hmm. and export our services, mm-hmm. like financial mm-hmm. services using call centers, mm-hmm. legal, telemedicine. There's so many, so many that can, and it doesn't have a lot of capex that's required to do that mm-hmm. because the human mm-hmm. capital is there already. So it's just a matter of capitalizing on that. Very good. Well, that is most insightful for those of you who are thinking about business. It sounds like you're getting free advice right here from none other than Karen Matessa. Um, Karen, my final set of questions uh, to you. You mentioned earlier on about managing work life, being a mom, being a businesswoman. What is your biggest challenge in making sure that nothing suffers in the process of trying to do it all? <laughs> A lot of prayer. (laughs) Um, I think that, um, again, it's a team effort. 
Mm. You know, I'm very blessed. Um, I have a very supportive family. And um, within that structure, wherever I need some subsidy, whether it's with the family or picking up the children from school, most of the time I don't have to do that. My husband's amazing. He does a lot of the drop-offs and pickups and, you know, spends time with them, with them as well, even though he's a very busy guy. But they do caution me when I'm out of order. Like we're not allowed cell phones at the dinner table. So that... <laughs> So that right. we make sure we have family time. And, you know, I tend to work. I tend to work very late into the night because I wait until I've done everything that I need to do that requires that's required of me for my family. They are my priority at the end of the day. Well, you my were family and communicating late last night, weren't we? So I think it might have been midnight. <laughs> I love where I am. <laughs> sure. and in fact, my teacher at all the businesses, they get such a shock when they wake up in the morning and they see some, <laughs> some email or message that's come through at three o'clock in the morning so yes I'm blessed that I'm able to to have the energy but I think it's because I'm passionate about everything that I do if you're passionate it becomes a uh, fun very often my husband when he sees me hectic and going crazy his question is are you having fun right. and I'm like mm-hmm. <laughs> you know I don't know about that but the passion um, to do the things that you like to do and for me the passion to make a difference in my society within my family within the country as a whole is huge okay It's huge for me. And it's evident talking to you. I am big on leaving words of encouragement to people who are watching this. We're all in this COVID fight together. It's affecting people in a multitude of ways. And with all the negative press that's out there and scary statistics we're hearing, what would you say to your fellow Zimbabweans just to lift their spirits up? Okay. I think that we, and I say we, coming together as Zimbabweans, we can build something very special together. But it takes that togetherness. We need to really, really come together, support one another, and and realize that it's not just about us and them, government and the private sector or government and the informal sector. We need to all work together, government and private sector and, you know, the NGOs, all of those different groups groups of people. Let us come together to be able to overcome what is happening in the world and in particular in Zimbabwe. Absolutely. Spot on. Karen, thank you ever so much for joining a Zoom in Zim. It's been a pleasure having you on. I look forward to seeing developments of all the great work that you're doing out there. Fantastic. Thank you so much for the invite. It was a real pleasure speaking with you. Likewise, Karen. You take care.